Good morning, Cross Community Church. Uh, for folks that are watching online, I don't know where this goes anymore, Terry, if, if we're all right here now or where, where all this gets sent, but welcome everybody that's here. Uh, my name's Craig Marquart. I am one of the elders here at Cross Community Church, and I just want to let you know it's really humbling to serve in the role of elder here, and uh, it's, it's also an honor to serve um, as we seek to uh, pay careful attention to ourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made us overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Uh, so it's, it's a calling that we take very seriously and one that when I um, consider my walk as an elder, I look to Romans chapter 12, verse 8, says that those who lead to lead with zeal. And I go, <clears throat> I'm a low-key kind of guy, you know, zeal's not high on that list of things that you would say about Craig Markport, but uh, I'll do my best to lead with zeal and to lead here at Cross Community Church. Um, my wife Annette and I have been married for nearly 37 years now. We have two grown daughters and a son-in-law, all of whom live in Ada. Um, Claire and Elise, our daughters, spent many Sundays, many Wednesday nights, and usually another night or two during the week growing up right here in this church. And uh, I'm just really happy to report, I'm thrilled, praise Jesus, that uh, we all have a very close, growing, vibrant walk with Jesus. Um, something else I think you need to know about me is that here in the midst of St. Louis Cardinals country, I grew up a Cubs fan. And um, it was just, it was, it was my dad, mom and dad were born in Chicago, I was born in Chicago, but... Uh, only for about a year, lived there, and then we moved to Philadelphia. And sometime before we moved to Tulsa in 1972, so I was like nine or ten years old, we got to see the Cubs play the Phillies in Old Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. And uh, I grew up a huge Cubs fan. I can still name most of the 1969 starting lineup for the Cubs. Uh, they had some Hall of Famers on that team. They had some quirky fellas on that team. They had a fiery manager, Leo DeRocher, uh, on, that, on that team. Uh, but my favorite player was Billy Williams. And Billy Williams was one of those fellas that threw right-handed, but he batted left-handed. And for those of you who know much about the dynamics of batting, and I don't, uh, those left-handed batters have a really smooth, natural-looking swing to them. You know, there's just something about the swing of a left-handed batter, and that's what drew my attention to Billy Williams. He, he could really rake the ball. Uh, he ended up in the Hall of Fame, uh, 426 home runs, a National League batting title. He was a batter, and, uh, and to watch him, watch his swing was really what got my attention, so that, much so that when I picked up a rock and tossed it in the air and knocked it with a stick, I was, I was Billy Williams. You know, I was the right-handed version of Billy Williams. Um, and I don't remember the year exactly, but before we moved to Tulsa, uh, we had that chance to see them play in, in Philadelphia. And I don't think it was on purpose, but our seats were along the third base line, right about where Billy Williams came out to play left field when the Cubs took the field. And every time he trotted out onto the field, my brother and I, my little brother and I, would stand up and we'd yell his name and we were waving our hands and we had a Cubs pennant, one of those little pennants, you know, we'd wave it over our head and we'd be hollering, Billy, Billy, Billy. Now, a famous guy like that is probably used to hearing his name and has tuned out a lot of what he hears, you know, as he's walking out there onto the field. But one inning, we got his attention. One inning, he turned around and he scanned the crowd and he saw me and my brother standing up there hollering, jumping up and down, and, and he waved at us. We had gotten the attention of my favorite ball player. Uh, the thing that I wanted most of that time, the thing that drove me to stand up, to yell, the thing that had me waving the Cubs pennant, the thing that probably had mom and dad shrinking back just a little bit at these two crazy kids they've got there yelling Billy Williams' name. The thing I wanted most was to connect with my favorite ball player. Well, years later, after I was saved, uh, the thing that I discovered I wanted most was to connect with my Savior. And I know that's true for all of us who believe in Jesus. Uh, you want to connect with God. You want uh, recognition from Him, not for the things that you've done. You want to know that you're connected to Him, though. You don't want to have to shout His name from the bleachers or wave a pennant to get His attention. You want to know that you have that connection. You don't want to be that insignificant speck in the crowd. You want to know that you're important to him. You want to know that you're connected. 
So where is uh, God when we're longing for that connection with him, when, we're, when we want that closeness, when we want that walk with God? And I think that starts with taking a look at where God is, where God is. The opening chapter of Genesis describes God's work in creation. Right? Those words tell of his creating uh, light and the heavens and the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky and the dry land and the sea and all that, that flies and grows and walks and swims in them. And on the sixth day, uh, God created man, the only part of his creation made in his own image. Uh, and on that day, God looked at his creation, he called it very good, and he rested. Now, it's important to distinguish the creator from his creation. Uh, though God created space, and I don't just mean outer space, but space, just everything. Uh, though God created space, he doesn't relate to space the same way that you and I relate to space. Um, he, re he relates much differently to, to uh, his creation. We have to be careful that we don't think of God as having a body like us, right? If we, uh, Jesus tells us in John 4.24 that God is spirit, and when uh, we went through the catechism with the girls when they were little, uh, one of those questions is, who is God? What is God? And, and God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like we do. Um, so God relates to space much differently than we do. And um, not just only much differently, but far greater than anything we can even imagine. He isn't confined by space or dimension. Uh, as creator, he fills all of his creation all of the time. There isn't a place or a time in any of creation where God isn't present. Uh, this attribute of God is called his omnipresence. He, uh, he doesn't have size restrictions or spatial dimensions. He is present at every point in his creation with all of his being. How do we get our heads around that? Uh, well, there's a couple of verses that describe God's omnipresence. Uh, one in Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse 23, God says, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? And then a more familiar uh, psalm, Psalm 139, uh, the psalmist writes beginning in verse 7, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God's word speaks of his omnipresence and believers should find comfort in that. Uh, we should find comfort in that attribute of God. To know that there's no way or nowhere, nothing we can do to get away from the presence of God because he fills his creation. It tells of his nearness to us, his love for us. God loves all mankind and all mankind shares in his omnipresence. God extends this common grace to all humans. Uh, Annette and I lived for a short while in Grable, Wyoming, and that's a lovely little town on the west side of the Bighorn Mountains. It's a couple hours east of Yellowstone National Park, and it was there that Annette met a woman who um, had recently relocated to northern Wyoming from the east coast, and as you can imagine, uh, there's a stark difference between northern Wyoming and anywhere on the east coast. Uh, and, and that woman was pretty convinced that when she was moving there that God could not find her in northern Wyoming. You know, that there was, there was a place where she could go to get away from God, and it was in northern Wyoming by her reckoning. Um, she told that story to Annette because she understood how ridiculous that was after she had moved there. She realized God is not, it's not impossible for God to find her there. Even, um, we see from Scripture that God is every place even in Grable, Wyoming. That can't separate us from God's omnipresence. So in the same way we know from Scripture that God is omnipresent and not contained by space, we know from Scripture that God is also very near to us. In fact, if we're saved, Christ is in us. We'll take a look at some of those verses here in just a minute. Um, but that truth that Jesus is in us, 
is sometimes referred to by theologians as the mystical union. You know, even the smartest guys on the planet are trying to figure this out. You know, how does Jesus live in us? As we learned from uh, Scripture, what, the week or two after, after Easter, Jason pointed out we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit indwells us. Christ is in us. We have the Holy Spirit. We don't fully understand it, but we know it through God's revelation in Scripture. We who confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead do, in fact, have Christ in us. And we can have comfort in that relationship. Uh, we can have joy and comfort and can experience his nearness to us with Christ in us. It was important to Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, um, that the churches he wrote to then, and in writing to us now, uh, that we understand the importance of the reality of Christ abiding in us, of Christ's indwelling presence. Paul's letters consistently repeat a message of the nearness of Christ. Paul's readers typically face difficult circumstances that we don't encounter here in these United States today. Um, and in fact, Paul himself faced a lot of hardships, every imaginable kind, and he drew on the strength that Jesus provides during those times. Uh, his hardships are enumerated in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He talks about being imprisoned and beaten. He was often near death. Five times he received 39 lashes. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was at drift a sea for a night and a day. He was frequently away from home. He was in danger from rivers, from robbers, from Jews, from Gentiles, from false brothers. He was in danger in the city, in the wilderness, at sea. He experienced sleepless nights. He was often hungry and thirsty, cold and exposed. And through all that, he recognized the nearness of Jesus as Jesus had promised, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. And in the midst of all that, and in part due to his anxiousness for the churches that he worked with, he consistently sends the message of the nearness of God, of God's indwelling presence of Christ in us. And a few of those verses that confirm that truth, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. In Galatians 2, 20, a verse that's a little more uh, uh, familiar to, to a lot of us, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul's writing uh, to make the word of God fully known, he says, in, uh, in verse 25 and starting in verse 26, he says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, he's going to tell us this mystery. He's going to tell us this mystery that's been hidden for generations, for ages. He's going to tell us this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the deposit, the guarantee for our future glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So again, mankind, the pinnacle of God's creation, the only part of creation created in God's own image, and God the Father chose not to leave mankind to walk through this life alone. Uh, in fact, he created us for relationship with him, and through his Son and his Spirit, he made a way for us to be connected to him even after sin had separated us from him. God's presence, his omnipresence, is among all his creation. His intimate presence, his indwelling presence, is among his people, among believers. So what do we do with that? Right? There's, there's nothing that believers need to do to have God in, ours, in our lives, in ourselves. His word is very clear on that. Uh, knowing then that there's no need to will God into our lives... We might see there's a need for us to understand God's will for our lives. Right? There's no need to will God into our lives, but we do need to understand God's will for our lives. We want to know the will of God. And at so many points in our life, 
we think, what's God's will for me? Uh, as youngsters, we think about what's God's will for the way I relate to family and friends. And as we go through schooling years and we, and we get to high school and, and we get out of high school, we wonder what's God's will for, uh, for a vocation uh, or the military or maybe going to college. Um, when we, about that time too, we're thinking what's God's will for how I relate to the opposite sex, God's will for marriage, God's will in parenting. Uh, what's God's, we seek God's will for where we work and where we live and where we go to church. Uh, we seek God's will for uh, getting close to retirement and tending to, to aging parents. There are a lot of points throughout our life that we really want to know God's will for those specific uh, uh, events. And those are important. I don't mean to belittle those, but we do very clearly have an answer in Scripture of God's will for us. Um, God's very clearly told us what his will is with the utmost clarity if you look in first uh, thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 it says for this is the will of god your sanctification well there's one place we can start you know there's a place where what's god's will for me very clearly your sanctification says first thessalonians 4 3 what is sanctification now it sounds like one of those churchy words but i mean here we have it in scripture but what is sanctification? It's two things, really. It's the act of being made holy, and it's the process of becoming holy. We are sanctified at the moment of salvation. It's at that point that the Holy Spirit indwells believers and makes our body his temple. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we're told that. God's Holy Spirit lives in holiness. He doesn't live in unholiness. We're made holy at salvation, and the Holy Spirit indwells us at salvation. And the second part of that definition, uh, because we live in human bodies here, we also start a lifelong process of salvation, of, be, or of sanctification, of becoming holy, and that happens at salvation too. The indwelling Holy Spirit of God enables us, empowers us to live a godly life. He empowers us to act in ways that lead to Christ-likeness. We walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, in order for the Spirit to produce Christ-likeness in us, Galatians 5.23, the fruit of the Spirit. When I think about sanctification, I think about a guy that uh, we got to work with for a few years. Cap Hogue was a giant of a man with a heart just as big as he was. Um, that wasn't always the case. Before he came to work for us in the late 90s, he, uh, he had a pretty tough background and, and, by his own admission, ran with a pretty rough bunch of bikers in California, got saved, left that life, and, and came back to Oklahoma, ended up working with, uh, with our outfit there. And um, it was then that I knew him. And, and as long as I knew Cap, his growing Christian faith was evident. Uh, Cap died in a, a really freak accident during the ice storm in 2000, and it was at his funeral that the preacher gave us a better glimpse into sanctification in Cap's life. Cap was a real excitable guy, and when he read something in Scripture, he would come into the preacher's office the following day and say, did you know the Bible says that we aren't to use coarse talk? This was news to him. And he'd say, I'm going to stop doing that. I mean, right away, Cap's inclination was he read it, he wanted to stop doing that. Cap wanted to grow in Christ-likeness. And as the Holy Spirit revealed truth to him, it was important to him that he align his life and his thinking with what he was learning in Scripture. So in Scripture, we learn things about who we are and what we have. And we saw that Jesus Christ is in us. And as, uh, as we, we know, too, that the Holy Spirit indwells believers. Um, if we look at what Peter wrote, a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, we see something else we have and something else that keeps us moving forward and growing in our sanctification. 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, those first several ver first four verses there, says Simon, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, so he's writing to believers, uh, by the righteousness of of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So to those of us who are saved, who have the same faith that Peter has, verse 3 tells us that God's divine power has granted to us, has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. That power that gives us those things that pertain to life and godliness becomes active or effective through knowing that God has called us to his glory and excellence. In verse 4, then, we see that we, if we keep uh, these precious and very great promises before us, if we remember those things, then we will be enabled to avoid temptations and will walk in paths of righteousness and love right on into eternal life. Uh, the goal of godliness and life, the goal is godliness and life, the source of strength to become godly is the divine power that gave us those things. And the connection between the two is knowing and trusting the promises of God. So, God has done something. What do we do? What do we do about that? How do we tap into that? Look down in verses 5, 6, and 7. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Those beginning words, for this very reason, those are important words. There's a connection between verses 3 and 4, and verses 5, 6, and 7. The command of verses 5, 6, and 7 is based on something God has done and is doing for us in verses 3 and 4. God's divine power has given us things that lead to life and godliness. Therefore, therefore, make an effort to be godly. Don't miss that connection. God has acted, therefore, you act. And don't turn that around. That would be heresy. Don't say, I've acted, now God will act. We don't make God out to be small and to be manipulated by us. We don't dare say that I've acted, now God will act. That's a false gospel. Right? The verses here don't point to God responding to our making every effort. It's just the opposite. We're responding to God's action. God has given us the things in verses 3 and 4. He's acted on our behalf, giving us those things we need for life and godliness. Therefore, verses 5, 6, and 7, we're told to labor to become godly. The process of sanctification. So, one thing to note about this list, uh, it begins with faith and it ends with love. And that's what we would expect in the New Testament. Uh, faith is at the root of this list. It's the basis of our confidence in the promises of God and of all the things that develop in our Christian life. Uh, the goal of all of which is, is love. And another thing to note, we don't complete these steps one at a time. It's not a checklist or an eight-step program. Uh, we aren't to accomplish those one at a time and move on to the next. There's a lot of overlap between each of those things. What Peter's saying is that true Christians don't stop growing in Christ-likeness, that their sanctification doesn't stop. True Christians want more than what they have spiritually attained. True Christians have a hunger for the things of God and to grow in their Christian life. Verses 5, 6, and 7 implore us to keep moving forward. Uh, in fact, to make every effort to move forward. Not content with just standing still in our faith, we're encouraged to apply our faith for virtue uh, as moral excellence. And at the same time, making every effort to grow in our knowledge of God's will. And again, keep striving forward, making every effort to have self-control, to have mastery over our passions. Um, and while we're doing that, we make every effort to grow in patience, making every effort toward godliness, that is, devoutness or developing a heart for God. Uh, and then making every effort to have affection for all the other people in this room and extending that to having love for all mankind, even our enemies, as Jesus points out uh, in Matthew 5, 44. So Peter says to be diligent to confirm our calling and election in verse 10. The confirmation of our calling is our progress in sanctification. 
And so herein lies the application, right? Are you making every effort towards virtue? Or are you making every effort to increase in your knowledge of God's character and his will? Are you making every effort to strengthen the power of your self-control? Are you making every effort to grow in patience, to cultivate godliness, to develop a heart for God? Are you making every effort to do those things? Are you making every effort to grow in your affection for your fellow believers? Are you making every effort to love every person, even the one you dislike the most? Uh, God's words... God's Word tells us to not be lazy in our faith. We aren't to be lazy in our faith, quite the opposite. We're encouraged to fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're told to run with perseverance the race before us in Hebrews chapter 12. We're told to press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus in Philippians 3. And here in 2 Peter, we're told to advance and grow and go forward in these qualities here on, in this list. So if these things are yours and are increasing, the text in verse 8 says that you will not be fruitless. But if these are not your earnest concern, then it may be you've lost sight of God's promises. Confirm God's calling in your life today. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, your word speaks clearly to us of your closeness to us, of your indwelling presence. Thank you for the comfort, for the joy we can have there. Father, we thank you too that your word calls us to um, to never be uh, just standing still in our faith, but to constantly be moving forward to be seeking you and growing in Christ-likeness. Father, thank you for the power that you give us to do those things that you've supplied and that we look forward to, uh, Father, how you will work in developing that in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.